people tend to put up blinders and see everybody else's faults but not their own or they're, they're walking off a cliff and they don't even realize it and they're just happily trotting along This is Champagne is also a band podcast. One songwriter, one song. I'm Sven, your host for a journey into the music of Champagne Urbana. Recorded in the Blue Box studio with a songwriter from the Champagne Urbana music scene, past or present. Champagne is also a band podcast is proud to be a part of the Champagne Showers podcast network. Welcome to Champagne is also a band podcast. Today, I have Tristan and Andy from Boxcar Graffiti. And you may know Tristan from such bands as Paint the Sky, Mouse Fight, Tristan Lake and the Chromatic Black, and of course, Boxcar Graffiti. And then you may also know Andy from Belladonna, Sideshow Freaks, and 10 Pounds Twisted. And of course, Boxcar Graffiti. Tristan and Andy, welcome to the show. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for having us. Today we're going to be listening to your song, Blind, which was released as a single in 2021. And so without further ado, let's listen to the song. I 
Welcome back. So my first and favorite question to ask is what came first? Was it the words or was it the music? In this case, it was the the music. It was the riff, the dun dukka dukka, the, the main one that you hear. Our drummer actually did a lot of the lyrics on this, but those came came after, yeah. Tristan brought that lick in. I said, well, give me a day to learn it. Usually he'll bring the lick in, or I'll bring the lick in, and then we just sit down and just play it over and over and over and over, lots of different ways, and see where it takes us, you know. And so was it that original D minor, like in the very, very beginning, that's the riff that you started off with? Yeah. Because I'm curious, when was it that you said to yourself, like, I'm going to, you know, change, basically change the chord by doing a different riff like you you change the chord that you're referencing in your riff like during the chorus i think that was actually an accident i think i was getting bored with playing standard tuning i went to the drop d and then so i i landed just a fret sharp i thought it sounded really pretty and then i wanted to see what we could do with that like it was originally an an acoustic piece i feel like a lot of the pull on and the off action comes from the acoustic really enchanted by those chords and i I didn't know what i was playing i I don't know what you would call those Uh, the variety of musicians that come in to be interviewed like some of them are like well of course i had to use the dominant fifth in this um you know and so they're all full on on like theory um and then there's just people that just say well i i just move my hand and it that's what comes out. I couldn't even tell you what chord they are, but I know that this works and it makes sense. And, you know, in, in the end, it all kind of falls into theory anyway, right? Like, it still follows a rule because we can hear it, right, you know? Right. I'm fascinated with, you know, the not knowing, but somehow still creating things that fall into onto those rules, right? You had the riff that you were doing and, and you started changing the chords by, you know, how you placed your hands during the riff. When did the chorus come about? Because at that point, the change in the chorus is you're no longer doing a riff, you're holding out chords. Tell me a little bit about how the chorus came about. I was probably uh, thinking that I really liked this snappy riff that we got going on and I didn't know how to take it forward. So I just took some of the chords that those notes formed and played them in different orders until I heard something that sounded in the direction I wanted to take it, and it was building up to something. A lot of times we just play it and see what happens next. Like, where where do our brains take us next? And trial and error, like, okay, let's try this. Ah, well, it, that was a bad yeah. idea. That, scratch that. Or we'll get bored and playing it, because we've played it like 70 times. Somebody will get bored and just do something out of... Just boredom, and we're like, "What? What was that?" So you, you mentioned that a, a lot of the lyrics were written by your drummer Gary. How did that get integrated with the the riff, and how did you translate that into your own melody? We had the music pretty much finished, and we sat on that for a while, and it didn't really seem like anything that we did matched it or made sense. Even considered maybe doing it without lyrics or bringing somebody else in to sing it, and. Gary came to practice with these lyrics, if I remember correct. We knew we we wanted to do something simpler, not so word heavy. I'm always curious about the integration of something that's you've already kind of set the tone by creating the music and then someone else brings in the lyrics. I'm curious how that experience is. Like, is that a typical way that boxcar graffiti works? Or, you know, is is I'm I'm just curious about your the typical songwriting process in the beginning i would show up with fully thought out ideas and that the guys didn't really have a whole lot of room for their own additions to the song to to make their mark on it and i think the longer we went along i realized that that was kind of stifling creativity so i thought even though sometimes i'll bring something in i think it should sound a certain way and somebody has an idea and it, it was like a knee-jerk reaction to no, I, I hear it this way, but... but like, I wrote but, it like this, but you it's, know. But yeah, yeah, it's yeah. super important to make sure everybody feels satisfied with it and puts their mark on it, and I don't want to... I feel like you just said, we've learned, and it took us, what, about two years? Two years to get... The process we have now. Yeah, so sometimes he'll come in with a really good, well-thought-out vocals. Everything already fits real well, but he only takes it so far because he knows that really no matter what, we're going to have some input on things. So he kind of like gets us to this point... And then let's make something out of this. So, I don't know, we just play it over and over and, and let it write itself as much as we can. You know? It seems to be the best yeah. way in the 
uh, what we're doing more recently. And then sometimes we'll come in with the riff. Sometimes he writes the words first, and sometimes mm. he'd write the music first. It just kind of how it works itself out. That's an interesting process because it seems like what makes a better song with a band is like that trust of, I trust you to know how to fill your part. I think that lends to a, a tighter group. Uh, wholeheartedly, I agree. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's yeah. absolutely true. Well, because we're father, son, brother, we can say there's too many notes in that bass line. We can just talk to each other without any emotion yeah, or feel no, safe. no ego or anything. It's just, mm. and if they, somebody feels like that, it's obviously for a reason. So I take out some notes in the bass line, you know, or I do something. It looks like based upon the bands that you've been in, it, that Boxcar Graffiti is the first one that both of you have been in together. Yeah. And so how long has Boxcar Graffiti been around? 2000. 19 yeah i think so oh, okay january january of 2019 i think we had never been in a no, project together before no, no. i was like why would we not yeah we were on our way to a christmas dinner he said well, why don't we do something together we you know, none of us were doing anything gary the drummer he'd never been in a band me and him had played in high you know we, we always jammed and stuff so we said let's bring gary in just to have fun he needs a little bit of healing you know because music heals what well, was a joke was for a long time we're not a band yeah we're, somehow we're but <laughs> we're not a, but we we're didn't not that's not why we we just were like let's get this let's just have fun you know and here we are so when did you realize that this was coming together so you brought in the riff um, Gary brought in some lyrics, or or am I skipping a step there? Where did it go from there? The riff was turned into a completely finished instrumental song, waiting for lyrics. Maybe we even started working on another song, yeah. and then we had an opportunity to like record it, so we decided we should put our effort into that. I think that we had a little bit of a deadline, if I remember right. We're very, very fortunate to work with uh, Visions Mixing and Mastering. It's Taylor Johnson from Taylor Vision Records and Bruce Ryder from Atlanta. We had told Bruce that we're going to send him the finished copy in two weeks. And I think that that's kind of we, we were... Time was getting close, and I think we went past the two-week mark. I kept re-recording the same things over and over yeah. again because I didn't think it was good enough. So during the actual process of recording it, did that actually solidify some of the writing that was going into it? Because, you know, I, yeah. I mean, you have a drummer, you have a bass, and you have a guitar and vocals. Obviously, there are other instruments, other guitars coming in. I can tell that there are certain spots where you switch from like the very staccato version of the, the riff to more of that legato, and it's usually more overdubbed multiple takes of, of that same riff. When did you bring in like the clean guitar? When was that the break spot? I'm glad we listened to it because I forgot about that. Oh. When we play it at practice, we don't use that. But when we play this song live, we have the ability to to use backing tracks for that sort of thing. But again, we just spend so much time, you know, inside of these songs. I wanted to break up the monotony of, of it being so heavy. They're pretty chord progressions. And I would actually love to hear it without uh, vocals and, and in like an acoustic setting someday. I think that would be cool to, yeah. to do. I always feel like in a heavier song, when you bring in that clean arpeggio chord of it, it's kind of this contemplative you're reflecting upon what's going on kind of i don't even know if it's like the reflection of the water but it's this thought you're, you're reflecting and thinking back on something and it's it's the perfect spot where you're repeating the the phrase of the am i free or am i not and i feel like you know through the repetition it's been recontextualized and then that addition i feel like that adds to you know what is the thought so after that long spot of me saying that i'm curious so to you what does this song mean i can't speak necessarily to what was in gary's heart when he was originally writing the words down but it could be a number of things people tend to put up blinders and see everybody else's faults but not their own or they're walking off a cliff and they don't even realize it and they're just happily trotting along or not having control over you know addiction or something of the sort uh, am i free you know i'd like to think i am but whatever the struggle that you have you know uh, whether it's uh, political addictions religion relationships, relationships yeah you can apply it. You know, it's, it's just kind of a universal thing. I don't think we really write about one thing. We always leave it translatable to what you're going through. You know, if somebody listened to it down the road, wherever the time that they're going through, it's translatable then. You're you not going to be like, oh, this was 
clearly written during you know whatever yeah don't mention beanie babies don't mention uh the mcrib uh don't mi- <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's, there's a lot of stuff you got to stay away from right. that will make it you know <laughs> yeah i, I you know sorry. dated i don't mean to tease but i was just no. like what would make it completely dated or have it be something that's you know not everyone specific uh um, oh, it's pretty easy experience <laughs> it's pretty easy yeah <laughs> there's the solo towards the end when did you decide that it had to have that wah to it i don't know why but i was just like alice in chains was like my thought when i Very, heard that yeah yeah that like just the way that that you you use the wah and i was wondering like is that an influence for you i think the the wah could definitely be a crutch uh for some people but i heard I heard the wah first in this instance. I just felt mm. like it needed to have that. Oh, well, I'm not necessarily a lead player anyways. So I guess in some ways it was a bit of a crutch, but it felt more like it was uh, speaking. You know, like it, it could almost be saying uh, something, uh, nothing too complicated, just something that you can hang on to and remember and get you through that, that bar or whatever. Do you usually write your music on the acoustic first and then bring it to the electric? I actually usually write everything on the acoustic and that's partially just because the amp and the guitar is at the practice space and when i was younger that it was just all i had access to period and you know so that's that's just what i did i think i enjoy playing the acoustic more i would be very curious to hear what this would sound like uh, acoustic it's slappy real slappy and you can <laughs> you can pull off and, oh. and it's got more of the charged you know when you let go of it I think it's interesting. So in the second verse, there was that decision to not go back to the drum motif that was there and and do that kind of the snare drive going through. Was that the Gary decision? I think originally it was just the snare and he actually turned the snare off and he was going for more of a like a Saint Anger era snare drum. <laughs> and then when we got it back from Bruce, that was gone and he had put in snare yeah it was, oh. <laughs> but, and, he made that. And, and he's the type of person where when he says i think it should go like this you agree i mean yeah, you got it. Say it i do love the cleans the part where you're going into just before the bridge and then i like that thought and then it goes into the solo part where it's just like besides using words to explain what's going on you're using the music to emote what you've been thinking about verse one and verse two and then the chorus and I, I feel like that does a very good job of conveying like this. I'm not sure. Like you still don't know, but you'd really like to know, I guess is the best way to say it. Like you, you just more than anything, you just like to know. That's one of my favorite spots. That's definitely my favorite spot of the song. I feel like there's a tension leading all the way up to that. And then, and then it's just a raw emotion and a release of all of that tension. And then, yeah. and then the am I free being like the lingering ringing in your ears after explosion leaning back into the chorus but mm. yeah that's yeah that's my favorite that the, the work the, it's my favorite part too i think it just all fell together real nice and that's my favorite part probably if i had to pick one why was this the song that you picked as your favorite we talked about it together originally we weren't sure what the layout of the the podcast would be so i thought i would be here alone and i just i didn't want to just talk about myself so i figured i'd try and be more representative of the whole band's experience so i asked everybody what what they thought and we we decided together that that was kind of the one we thought was the most put together even in the midst of the current coronavirus pandemic the jubilee cafe is continuing to serve packaged home-cooked meals free to all every Monday evening, 5 to 6.30 p.m. Meals are available for pickup outside the 6th Street door to the Community United Church of Christ in Champaign, Illinois, 805 South 6th Street. Jubilee Cafe's mission remains the same. Feed hungry people by cooking healthy and delicious meals. We are open to anyone who cares to receive a meal. For information on the meal or how to volunteer, go to the Jubilee Cafe CUCC Facebook page or email us at jubilee.cafe at community-ucc.org. Welcome back. So 
Andy, do you have a favorite venue? Um, I really don't have a favorite venue. I mean, the Canopy Club's nice. Um, every place is good. City, C- is City good. Center is real loud and slappy. They're doing good things for the scene. Yeah, abso- absolutely. Yeah. West End. West the End. West End, B Met. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah it's it's, it's actually, not a Champagne uh, County venue, yeah. but they did a lot of work. The West End's been in business Forever. consistently Forever. for probably 80 years or something oh, yeah. like that yeah. but they redid yeah. it and uh, it's owners. beautiful it's wow. really beautiful and it's a it's a couple that owns it and uh they put a lot of work and heart and they yeah. really care yeah it's cool awesome. nice little stage it's fun tristan do you have a favorite local venue uh, i think you hit it on the head with like the canopy club and the city center they do a lot i think does the red the red herring has bands like if they have something bigger or a louder band they'll have it up in the the chapel, the Channing Murray Chapel, in there, which honestly, I love. I love that space because it's nice and echoey and woody, and like it has just the right vibe, and it's not huge. Good so food. yeah, yeah, exactly. So I'm curious about the name Boxcar Graffiti. Who came up with that name? Gary, our drummer. Okay. He was waiting at an intersection for a train to go by, and it was one of those where it creaks to a stop yeah. and then starts backing up. Oh. And he just had to, he just said boxcar graffiti. And yeah. That's, that's, he was adamant about that. And well, and that was during the time where we weren't a band. Yeah. We well, just weren't a band. And we, we were thinking, well, we might as well have a name since we're not a band, but we call ourselves something. And it was forever. We tried a couple different things. Yeah, it was a um, bunch of them. And then he just said. Boxcar graffiti. He said, that's it. And he had that look in his eyes like, this is it. And I'm. Yeah. And so that's what we became. And I'll admit now, at first I was like, I know. Uh, I like, what? What? What then he goes, about? he said, it's unappreciated art. And, and that's, that's what, it was. that's what we're like. And okay, I was like, okay. that's what I'm doing right now. Yeah. I'm unappreciating <laughs> this idea that you came in here with. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah. But yeah, I mean, it huh. wasn't like when he said that, that unappreciated art, I just had a little soft spot in my, you know, and I was like, oh, okay. And we had to pick something. So we, might as well just go with it. So. You grew up yeah. in a small town, and a lot of what you see uh, from the outside world is art on trains Stuff going that comes by. From LA and, and oh, Chicago, you know, and New just, York. It's just like a little. When you mentioned the whole, the train stops and then starts to back up. I don't know many people that don't live in rural areas that <laughs> ever get to see that, but it's that is <laughs> that is the ultimate disappointment. Because when you're like, wait, is this slow? It's slowing. It's slowing down. Oh, oh my god! And it's already like they're stopping. It's stopped, yeah. and then they the back. Next intersections yeah. taken to yeah. The, oh. the next intersection to come down, like which is a mile miles down the road. Yeah. Yes. for contact. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And you're already late. So yeah. yes. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh yeah, and it's always you have to make that choice. It's like now. I know it's blocked off at this intersection. Is it smart for me to take a right or is it for me to take a left? Because if it's backing up, it may just back right, up over right. the intersection. Ooh, that's a gamble. Yeah. <laughs> or they stop and it's like there's one car left to go and that's it. Just one and they stop and uh, go, they start backing up. It's, yeah, anyway. So that's, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so you said that you have a, a recording studio here. At, here, I mean, in, in Ivesdale, your own uh, personal recording studio, correct? Yeah. What's what's the name of the recording studio? Well, it's we don't really we oh. just call it Studio Two Hundred Eight, just because yeah, it's the number on the building. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, I mean we we, and we use we, it for all types of things. It's not like a studio that we bring other people in and record. Other we would if they were yeah. they were decent people and our good friends and stuff. You know, I mean, yeah, we have a tight we, circle that yeah, we built it for ourselves. Well, that's that's part of the thing I was curious about is because you know you're you're sitting in a spot that I kind of built for myself right, for right. how I wanted to end up using it, and originally I planned for it to be for you know groups of people, but not you know not huge groups of people. Right. But then I realized I wanted to use this space for recording podcasts, and so it kind of evolved into that. So I'm curious, did you just decide you needed a practice slash recording studio space and that's where it went or no i it wasn't intentional i own the building that's in we just when we decided to jam well, let's just do it up here we're like well should probably get some microphones yeah yeah we probably <laughs> should get this and then so you can hear me over the drums and then we're like well we need a digital interface we'd buy 
just bored and then we're like later on we'd be like well then then we moved into different part of the building and then and now we just have yeah, i mean you could loosely yeah. call it a studio yeah it's, yeah yeah so we just we upgraded and upgraded and upgraded and wanted this toy and wanted that toy and then eventually mm. we're somehow we similar i'm sure to how your, your profession yeah. is it, as well well it used to be that i would i would look to spend my money on on guitars mm. and now i'm just like oh that that's it's a real nice microphone. Nice you right, right, microphones. Yeah, it's like, yeah, who would have thought? A better microphone would make you sound better, you know? <laughs> yeah. Although I am I am a fan of the the microphone that you don't have to really worry about. Like, if you get an, a Neiman or whatever like that, I, I you know, a $2,000 microphone, and yes, they continue up, but... Yeah. I would never be able to use that thing. I would be too terrified of breaking it. But yeah. but like that SM7 that you're you're talking on Andy, it's like it's it's sturdy. Yeah. It's it's about that right price point and like anyway, whatever. Reliable. Yeah. Uh welcome to the Mike's show. Um, <laughs> yeah. You just decided to turn it into a studio space that you could, you know, rehearse in and create music. So, I'm assuming that you recorded this song blind in the studio. So, uh, was that, d- is it just you three recording, or is somebody else coming in and helping uh, you record? Uh, well, I mean, we've been very fortunate. I mean, I have to say that we have a lot of support people. Uh, Chet Utterback, he's our sound engineer, and I've known Chet for a long time. And Shane Hall, he's our light technician. Um, Terry Gifford, he's just all around everything, you know, helps wherever, you know. Dave stumbled in whether we'd invited them or they just you know stopped by and then they just came part yeah they're like oh my it. god you know listen mm. you know i just want to be a part of this and we're like well yeah did you, you hit your head real hard because <laughs> we don't pay anything you know we've been we've had a support group so, and, yeah. and he's been a sound man on the cu scene for years and years and yeah, years yeah. uh I th- he worked with uh ruble yeah he mark, studied mark it under ruble. mark ruble yeah. at a pogo, pogo, studios. pogo studios. Yeah, studios so he, he knows a lot about what microphones to use which direction to point him you know he is a stickler for making sure everything's clean and which i don't pay any attention to and i'd be like <laughs> time for a new cord no. and like let He's me like, no, see let that me fix it. let me fix it our policy is kind of like anybody who can get something out of it and wants to get something out of it like come be a part of the team be part of the family really yeah, yeah. Be, come be a part of the family any way that we can facilitate your creative needs you know yeah. we, we want to be that for people and we want to kind of foster a little a scene you yeah. know yeah we're huh. we accidentally created a little scene it's, mean, it's, it's, it's working it's, it's, it's working yeah. on it now that you've kind of brought that up you know as the pandemic had had waged on i really missed having that live scene and being able to go out and see other people perform and and be part of an audience um and in that process i thought about you know, how much I missed it and how important it is to be able to connect with people over music and sharing the same space. But then that made me reflect upon like, what does make a good scene? So I'm kind of curious on your thoughts about what makes a good scene. So I'll start with you, Tristan, like, what do you think makes a good music scene or even just a good community? I think any community of like-minded people is important that they're not competing with each other. Yes. That it's a network that they can all rely on and you can call so and so and be like, Hey man, I need this cord or what would you do in this scenario? Or would you like to come, you know, hop on the drums for a song? I think that makes us all stronger instead of shutting ourselves off to any form of you know network or community, I guess. Yeah. No, ego. You got to, yeah, yeah, you no gotta, ego. You gotta, yeah, you can't e- ego's a ego's a, a scene, a scene killer. killer. Hmm. Ego is yeah. the worst thing you can ever. I mean, I, I don't. I, mean, know, I, yeah. I think anyway. No, that's fair. And so, I guess, like, is would you like to add anything on that? Or everybody involved, if they are playing music for the very first thing of the love, that feeling you get when you're playing for the love. If if you have a group of people that are like that then you're going to create a tight scene. It'll turn into a, a family environment. But it's whenever you get the people with the ego and the people that are trying to... Do it for the wrong reasons. Uh, uh, yeah, for the wrong reasons. Yeah. You know, music's primal. And music is emotional. And it's never meant to be anything more than that. You can't do it for the wrong reasons. And hmm. then it'll, it'll be a tainted 
environment i think it's important i think you were saying something along these lines the other day of it's important for venues to invest in the next generation of musicians yeah yeah venues if you want to create a scene as a bar owner or a club owner you have to invest especially original bands because right around here i personally feel that original music is is unappreciated that, art there's room for improvement in yes. the area i feel like yeah. there's a lot of venues in the champagne urbana scene that do a lot to facilitate that and you know like open mics and such original bands night i don't know if anybody does that but that'd be a cool thing for local people yeah. or maybe an all ages thing where it's like 14 and 15 year olds can hop up there so i know as a, as a business owner business is business and but if you want to have a really big scene pick a wednesday or a, be, be real courageous to pick a friday or a mm-hmm. saturday and have five local bands that are original wow, that would be cool yeah. you know <laughs> and yeah. you know have them that, you know you're not going to make money the first and that night. is courageous yeah uh, yeah and don't people like look you know you're not going to get paid which if you're an original band and if you're, you're playing it for the right it. reason yeah. then you're not going to care mm-hmm. you know there's always the people that oh you gotta you gotta make this money you gotta make that money but then yeah, you. Do. I mean, yeah, yeah. That's important. But, <laughs> Fired up. Yeah. No, but I, I, I feel passionate about that. You know, have, you've been I, in the scene. Yeah, for yeah. I was decades. in a scene that was like that. You know, uh, when I was younger. Take the chance, make the investment, get these bands in front of people. In the back end, you're going to create a scene where your place is where people want to go because it's it's packed. The crowd is energetic. Mm-hmm. They're not there for cover tunes and sweet home alabama you know and stuff nothing wrong with that but no no, no and there's not yeah. that's that's absolutely important part of, you're going to create an environment where that becomes a thing and then before you know it you're gonna it's going to be the place to be but you got to make that investment you got to take that chance i feel like at some point we did have that oh yeah and, but oh, yeah. it it just kind of cycles and unfortunately i i don't know it it is i i mean not to be all field of dreams about it but it's like if you do build it they will come right so right you got to be not afraid to fail there's some real yeah. geniuses out there there's a lot of They're really good talented musicians in this area in, yeah yeah sitting in their parents house yeah writing stuff amazing and they just need yeah they, they need, need they need some place to go you know you know where and it's got to be original it has to be original music if you do that, you're going to have a band that comes out of this area because of you, you know? Champagne is also a band podcast is proud to support Exile on Main Street. Exile on Main Street, located in the old train station building at 100 North Chestnut Street in downtown Champaign, has been helping to build record collections since 2004. Carrying a wide array of new and used LPs, CDs, and video games. Exile on Main Street has something for just about any music enthusiast and old school gaming devotee. Exile also hosts regular free live music shows on its stage, so be sure to check out their Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter pages for the up-to-date details on the next upcoming event. Open seven days a week. They can be reached by phone at 217-398-MAIN. That's 217-398-6246. Welcome back. So, Andy, what is your favorite non-musical thing or things? I'm, I'm an outdoorsman, so we built an indoor archery range at the studio so when we're not playing, we can shoot some targets, so or crossbows. Do- Oh, crossbow too? Yeah, yeah. Um, so do you, I'm, I'm assuming that's like compound bow. Yeah. Now you've got me all curious. So the space that you have, that it's you big. usually have to have a huge spot to be able to do archery. Because what, what's the standard length? There's no standard length. 15 yards is the longest you can shoot in this one. It's not how far you can shoot. It's the repetition and the muscle memory. Uh, there's a part of the building that we know that nobody's going to pop around a corner. Yeah. It's yeah. Ri- the, the, the door's locked. It's, oh, it's, it's, yeah, it's we're, we're very, very safe. safe. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm a stickler about safety. I'm a whitetail hunter, fisherman, camping. It, it, it's outdoors, and it's family-oriented. Um, those are the, yeah. kind of the, probably the two things. Yeah. You know? How did you get into archery as your outdoor activity? Um, I, I was always into it as a kid, but 
uh, gr growing up without a father, uh, I didn't have anybody to show me. So one of my friends invited us to go. He was doing sound for Ted Nugent at an outdoor show. I went over there. We were in, in the sound engineer area. And his wife was standing next to me. And this little kid was sitting on my feet. And he told this story, a very passionate I mean, he just, he just got me so fired up. I left there and I said, I'm going to teach myself. He, did, he told a passionate story about archery or uh, well just it learning? was about a dog that he died a, a dog his favorite dog that passed away and oh. how he took it out in the woods and uh you know huh. said his goodbyes anyway it was a, it was a the whole thing his whole um, was very passionate he did, he told a passionate story about archery uh, or well just it learning? was about his favorite dog that passed away and oh. how he took it out in the woods and oh. said his goodbyes it, it, i just left there knowing that i had to like it really changed it really did changed it, yeah it was like a huh and ted nugent being the kind of bridge between your guitar playing yeah yeah i've always uh, you know yeah. been a and ted nugent fan tree. anyway tristan what's your favorite non-musical thing <laughs> you God, can name a really bunch can. of things you're hitting deep here man <laughs> <laughs> i like uh but i like uh random facts and like trivia and i've been watching this british uh, cable quiz show called QI and uh, just talk about random facts and stuff. Meditate, uh, yeah, I, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm very spiritual. I, I'm passionate about learning the various disciplines and incorporating them into my life and taking all of the things that kind of overlap from the different traditions and, you know, making my own thing. I, I, I meditate. I like to spend quiet time. I, ironically, Really enjoy my solitude. Yeah, I'm a big Alan Watts fan, uh, Eckhart Tolle. So I'm curious what got you into pursuing these different traditions and, and like kind of melding them into like your own personal walk. I think it was probably when I was in college and uh, encountering different people and different ways of viewing the world. And I grew up here in this rural community, as wonderful as it is. But then I moved to the city and got to see things from perspectives i never had before i think it was eckhart toll uh, and i don't remember how i first heard about him but maybe i just found the audiobook on the app store when i say i'm picking and choosing from various traditions it's really he did a lot of the you know, curating those things and, and like cutting through the layers of accumulated extra it's probably just you know looking for personal kind of scape I mean, I don't, I'm, I don't need to That's like... That's a great question. I don't need to dig into you, but I just, I was just curious. And it is a very personal question, no, you know, not, to ask. I, I so love I to just, talk about it. I'm glad <laughs> it came up, actually. Is your meditation based on any particular... I don't know if that's even a good question, but, you know, like, I'm, I'm curious what... Yeah, like, what, what that... If, what that, tradition are you holding on to with... Well, there's all kinds of different meditation techniques, and I think I like to break it down to the bare minimal of just being hyper aware and just burying my awareness in something and, and not turning away from it for as long as I can. And whether that's my breath, which is, you know, kind of a cliche thing, but it's a cliche for a reason because it works or just a spot on the ceiling or staring at the moon or like the light you have in your ceiling, which is changing color over there. I could just look at that for 10 minutes and, and music is a form of meditation, very yeah. performing and playing your instrument is a form of meditation i feel because whenever whenever that's happening and we're all you know just gelling nothing in the world exists except for that little space right there and what we're you know and our, my fretboard i guess uh, I, I guess I, I pace that's kind pace. of that's kind of a meditation <laughs> yeah have you ever heard of there's been studies of like and i'm sure that this would probably happen with bands as well but choir groups having a very very similar heartbeat for no, bringing in a large that, group like that that they actually will kind of bio what do you, what do you call it like the bio sync like yeah. because of wow the, well i mean they're all taking breaths at about the same time because they're you know singing on cue and i think there's a sense of community not just in the physical but also like energy like connecting yes. yeah we all have an energy yeah yeah and maybe in that moment you you kind of transcend your your individual self and you become the the larger organism which is all breathing together and yeah, it's, there's, it's there's seeking way up more and, going on than what as humans we're wired to know 
Tristan, Andy, thank you so much for being on the show and telling me all about your song Blind and, you know, talking about the music scene and a little bit about your studio and, you know, how that all came about in the name of Boxcar Graffiti and your favorite non-musical things. And I really appreciate the conversation that we yeah, had. So, yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you yeah. for having us. And I hope you'll have us back. Yeah, man. it's going to be very you've fun. You've got to come be part of the Boxcar family, man. Come on to the studio and okay. check it out. Hey, everybody. Thank you for listening to Champagne is Also a Band podcast. This is Tristan. And this is Andy from, from Boxcar, Boxcar Graffiti. Reminding you, great, great music, music is out there. there. Go, Go find, find it where you live. a wrap. You almost have an NPR voice. It's so good. on the inside. It's slappy, real slappy.